Welcome to the Heathen Trans Girl Podcast with me, your host, Kaya Fox. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you for joining. In today's episode, we are going to be talking about the figure of hell in Norse mythology, daughter of Loki and Angerboda, sister to Fenrir and Jormungandr. She is depicted in the lore as being a provider of home and abode for the deceased, those who die of sickness and old age, although we will see at least one exception to that in the primary attestations. She is also depicted as being half warm flesh colored and half corpse blue colored. Now that was just a little teaser of what's going to go down. I have nine different attestations that I am going to be reading from today. Four of them are referring specifically to the figure of hell. The remaining five could potentially be referring to either the figure or the location. I will save further discussion for the location of hell to another episode possibly including some of the other realms in there. We'll see how the research goes. We have already touched on the road to hell a little bit in our funeral funeral practices and road to hell episode. So if you're interested, definitely go take a peek at that. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it for the introduction. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to Jackson Crawford's team at Hackett Publishing, as well as Carolyn Larrington, for both of them giving permission for to me to read portions of their translations of the Poetic Edda. Our sources for today are going to include, as mentioned, the Carolyn Larrington 1996 translation of the Poetic Edda, Jackson Crawford 2015 translation of the Poetic Edda, as well as two public domain sources, the Henry Adams Bellows, 1936 translation of the Poetic Edda, and the Arthur Gilchrist Berdour translation of the Prose Edda, 1916. As always, the links to this, or the specific attestations, will be typed up and written in the show notes or the description. If you're listening on Spotify or YouTube, you can find all of the references there. Our first attestation today comes from Gilfa Ginning, Chapter 34, Prose Edda, Bredour Translation. Yet more children had Loki. Angerboda was the name of a certain giantess in Jotunheim, with whom Loki got three children. One was Fenris Wolf, the second Jormungandr, that is, the Midgard serpent. The third is Hel. But when the gods learned that this kindred was nourished in Jotunheim, and when the gods perceived by prophecy that from this kindred great misfortune should befall them, and since it seemed to all that there was great prospect of ill, first from the mother's blood, and yet worse from the father's, then all father sent gods thither to take the children and bring them to him. Then, when they came to him, straight away he cast the serpent into the deep sea, where he lies about all the land, and this serpent grew so greatly that he lies in the midst of the ocean, encompassing all the land, and bites upon his own tail. Hell, he cast into Niflheim, and gave her power over nine worlds to apportion all abodes among those that were sent to her, that is, men dead of sickness or of old age. She has great possessions there. Her walls are exceedingly high and her gates great. Her hall is called Eljufnir, sleet cold. Her dish Hunger, hunger. Surtr, famine, is her knife. Ganglati, idler, her thrall. Ganglot, slaven, her maidservant. Falandavarod, pit of stumbling, 
her threshold by which one enters. Cor, disease, her bed. Blikjandablor, gleaming bale, her bed hangings. She is half blue-black and half flesh-colored, by which she is easily recognized, and very lowering and fierce. There is so much good stuff to chew on in that attestation. As far as attestations go, um, like I know we don't have very many, but there's a lot to that one. A lot of different things we could pick apart. Um, one of the things that I did want to mention was that she is not described as half skeletal, but rather half blue, black. Falks translates this as black, although Crawford in his translation, as well as his PhD dissertation, argues that blue should be the interpretation here um, as meaning the color of a corpse, and also points out that there are a couple sagas that use the term blar sam hell, or sam hell, blue as hell, to describe the color of dead corpses. And that is not to say that I have anything against artistic depictions of hell, showing her kind of like split down the middle, down the nose as half alive and half skeleton. I own a couple of those art pieces, as a matter of fact. They're gorgeous. I think what's important here is the metaphor behind it. But I did want to point out that in the lore, it's not described as half skeleton, but rather half corpse blue and half flesh colored. And it doesn't specify which half could be top half, bottom half, right half, left half, front half, back half, or little patches all over. Again, what's important here, I think, is the metaphor, the meaning that you can get out of this half and half depiction. Now, because this is the passage that mentions Hell's family, I'm going to take a quick second to do a little family tree type of thing. So, Angkor Bodha, we have done the past episode about, a ton of great stuff in there, described as a Gigar, G-Y-G-R, giantess from Jotunheim. Her father, Loki, is counted among the Aesir. Loki has a Jotun father, Farbauti, and a mother, Laufe, who is counted among the Aesir in Nafnathuler, I want to say. So I'm going to play into these distinctions for a minute and then scrap them all. So Hel is Jotun on her mother's side and half, at least half Jotun on her father's side, possibly full because Laufey is counted among the Asinior. But we also see characters like Skadi, who is Jotun being counted among the Asinior, and Loki, who is half Jotun, is counted among the Asir. So, <laughs> yeah, at least three-quarter Jotun, um, but also could definitely be counted among the Asir. The distinctions are very silly, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, you can say three-quarter Jotun and at least half Isir. Yeah, it's silly. Some people like to say that Hel is not a goddess. She is a Jotun. But, I mean, in this passage, we read that she has... Did it say authority or power? Let me look. Um, yeah, she was given power over nine worlds. So someone who holds power over nine worlds, I'm I'm inclined to call them a goddess. I usually, in my personal practice, refer to her as queen. Um, that kind of skirts the issue, but she definitely has big goddess vibes, in my opinion. But that's my take. 
So this next attestation that we're going to read from, I have already read through in the Funeral Practices and Road to Hell episode, but I am going to reread it here because these episodes are kind of like audio bookmarks, trying to collect all the different attestations in one place. And this is really the only other big, chunky, juicy one that we have to chew on. Um, yeah. So settle in for probably be a couple minutes of a read on this one. Gilf beginning, chapter 49, Prosetta, Bredour translation. Now, this is to be told concerning Hermod, that he rode nine nights through dark dales and deep, so that he saw not before he was come to the river Gyol, and rode on to the Gyol bridge, which bridge is thatched with glittering gold. Modgud is the maiden who guards the bridge. She asked him his name and race, saying that the day before there had ridden over the bridge five companies of dead men. But the bridge thunders no less under thee alone, and thou hast not the color of dead men. Why ridest thou hither on Hellway? He answered, I am appointed to ride to hell to seek out Balder. Hast thou, perchance, seen Balder on Hell Way? She said that Balder had ridden there over Gyol Bridge, but down and north lieth Hell Way. Then Hermoth rode on till he came to Hellgate. He dismounted from his steed, and made fast his girths, mounted, and pricked him with his spurs, and the steed leapt so hard over the gate that he came no wise near to it. Then Hermod rode home to the hall, and dismounted from his steed, went into the hall, and saw sitting there in the high seat Balder, his brother, and Hermod tarried there overnight. At morn, Hermod prayed Hel that Balder might ride home with him, and told her how great weeping was among the Aesir. But Hel said that in this wise it should be put to the test, whether Balder were so all-beloved, as had been said. If all things in the world, quick and dead, weep for him, then he shall go back to the Aesir. But he shall remain with hell, if any gainsay it, or will not weep. Then Hermoth arose, but Balder led him out of the hall, and took the ring Draupnir, and sent it to Odin for a remembrance. And Nanna sent Frigg a linen smock, and yet more gifts, and to Fulla a golden finger ring. Then Hermod rode his way back and came to Asgard, and told all those tidings which he had seen and heard. Thereupon the Aesir sent all over the world messengers to pray that Balder be wept out of hell. And all men did this, and quick things, and the earth and stones and trees and all metals, even as thou must have seen that these things weep, when they come out of frost and into the heat. Then, when the messengers went home, having well wrought their errand, they found, in a certain cave, where a giantess sat, she called herself Thok. They prayed her to weep Balder out of hell. She answered, Thok will weep waterless tears for Baldur's bale fire. Living or dead, I loved not the churl's son. Let hell 
hold to that she hath. I adore this passage for many reasons. I mean, the ride to hell itself is such an adventure, but I think what is particularly relevant in this passage for this episode is that we hear hell herself speak. So I'm going to reread that one line that she does say. Hal said that in this wise it should be put to the test whether Balder were so all beloved as had been said. If all things in the world, quick and dead, weep for him, then he shall go back to thy seer. But he shall remain with Hell if any gainsay it or will not weep. Now there are a thousand different spiderweb threads going out in every direction of things that we could explore from this. I mean hell holding on to Balder, I think allows him to come back after Ragnarok in the future. Also, she's kind of challenging this big blanket statement that Hermod said that everyone is weeping. She says, well, if everyone's weeping, then it should be easy. Go make sure everyone's weeping and then I'll let Balder out. This is also my personal experience. I think she kind of knows that not everyone is. Um, a couple lines after where I stopped reading. Um, it says that Thok is presumed, the giantess who did not weep, is presumed to be Loki. And in Lokasana, the flighting of Loki in the poetic Edda, we get Loki himself kind of attesting to that. And that last line, I love it. Um, Let hell hold to that she hath. Let hell hold what she has. The Old Norse is Haldi her thvi erhethir. I think there is something to be said about the order of death or like the finality of death in a way. And if we take a look at this, I'm kind of bouncing around here for a second, so bear with me. This is my interpretation, my connections. Um, but if we bounce back to the story of how Balder died, it was because his mother tried to make him immune to any type of harm so that he could not die and would never die. And Loki, who's Um, whose affair, who's mating with Angerboda, um, as well as the three children, they all kind of seem to have tie-ins with death, destruction, consumption, um, decay. So I think it was almost an affront to these concepts that Loki and Loki's family represent um, this destructive energy to try to absolutely refuse any type of decay, to try to preserve Baldur's life infinitely. Um, also, rabbit trail off of this rabbit trail, um, we get back in the story, the episode of Skadi, we get the tie-in of how Loki is kind of responsible for the removal of Idun's apples of immortality from the gods. So that's another connection to Loki being responsible for kind of removing immortality, removing the timelessness from the gods and ensuring change and decay, this part of like the entire circle, the cycle of life requires, at least this is my interpretation, um, Loki resent, uh, represents the requirement of change and dissolution in order for the circle, the cycle to be whole. And so in those last words, let hell hold what she has, I think that's kind of Loki putting their foot down and saying, no, death is necessary, period, full stop. 
Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now and move on to the next attestation. Okay, these next two are the final two that we have that are mentioning hell as the person, the figure specifically. They are both short ones. They both come from Skald Skopper Mall in the Prosetta. First one is chapter 12 or 5 in the Folks translation. This is the Perdur translation. Kennings for Balder. How should one paraphrase Balder by calling him son of Odin and Frigg, husband of Nana, father of Forseti, possessor of Ringhorni and Draupnir, adversary of Hod, companion of Hel? And the next one is coming from chapter 23, Berdur translation, or 16 in the Fox translation. This is Berdur. How should one paraphrase Loki? Thus call him son of Farbauti and Laufe, or of Nil, brother of Blisr and Helblindi, father of the monster of Van, that is Fenris Wolf, and the vast monster, that is the Midgard serpent, and of Hel, and Nari, and Ali. We are now in the category of possibly the person, maybe the place. So for this next attestation, we're hopping over to the Poetic Edda, Grimness Small, stanza 31. I'm going to be reading from Larrington, Crawford, and Bellows, alternately to get a little comparison going on. So starting with Larrington, stanza 31. Three roots there grow, in three directions, under the ash Yggdrasil, hell lives under one. Under the second, the frost giants. The third, humankind. Now from Bellows. Three roots there are that three ways run neath the ash tree Yggdrasil. Neath the first lives hell. Neath the second the frost giants, neath the last are the lands of men. Crawford. Beneath the tree Yggdrasil are three roots which grow in three directions. Hell is beneath one, Njotunheim beneath another, and Nithgard beneath the third. So I wanted to read those three different translations because in Larrington, it seems like it's talking about the residence under each of the roots. In Crawford, it seems as if it's talking about the different realms that lie under each of the roots. And Bellows kind of hits a middle ground where... Neath the first lives hell, neath the second the frost giants, neath the last are the lands of men. So I think it's fairly clear that we can we can decide like who and what are under each, but hell the realm or hell the person, big shrug, live under one of the roots. Our next attestation is going to be a quick mention of Baltar's Thromer stanzas 6 and 7, Poetic Edda, Crawford Translation. Odin said, Tell me news from hell, and I'll tell you news from above. Whose arrival are the benches draped with straw for? Why is the floor all covered with gold? The witch said, The mead is brewed for Baldur's arrival. The shield is placed over the fresh brew. Now you can listen to an extended reading of that passage over in the funeral practices episode. I just wanted to mention it again because I think it indicates whether here it's talking about the location of Hal or the character of Hal seems to be showing some type of hospitality and 
preparation for the arrival of someone important. Our next attestation is coming from Voluspa, stanza 43 in the Poetic Edda, Larrington translation. This is talking about the roosters crowing to herald the beginning of Ragnarok. Golden comb crowed for the Aesir. He wakens the warriors at the father of hosts. And another crows down below the earth a sooty red cock in the halls of hell. And proceeding with the discussion of Ragnarok, we continue in Gilfaginning 51, Prose Edda, Berdur. Thither shall come Fenris Wolf, also, and the Midgard Serpent, then Loki and Hrimir shall come there also, and with him all the rim giants, all the champions of hell follow Loki. So in those last two, we see a red rooster crowing in the halls of hell, place where person shrug. We see all the champions of hell, place or person shrug, following Loki to Ragnarok. As our last attestation for today, we're in the Poetic Edda, Fafnismal, stanzas 10 and 21 from the Crawford translation. So this is after the hero Sigrith deals a fatal blow to the dragon Fafnir, and then they sit um, talking for quite a while. <laughs> so in their discussions, we have a couple mentions of how Sigrith said, Every man will have control of his wealth until his fated death day. But there is a time when each one of us leaves here for hell. Stanza 21. And you, Fafnir, stay here and die, and hell can have you. Now I wanted to include this last passage because... Yes, it can be interpreted as either person or place, but I think what's more interesting is that this great hero, Sigurd, is saying that each one of us will make our way from here to hell. And indeed, we later see in some of the poems in the Poetic Edda that Brynhild follows Sigurd to hell. Now Sigrith, I mean, uh, yeah, some spoilers, <laughs> but the way it plays out is fun enough, so I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. Um, Sigrith does not die of sickness or old age. Sigrith is a hero and Sigrith is slain. Balder is slain. They both go to hell. So in this, we see that whether one is a god like Balder, a hero like Sigurd, or if one dies of sickness and old age, each one of us leaves here for hell one day. And with that, we'll go ahead and conclude the episode. So in quick summary, today we saw Hel as one of the three children of Angerboda and Loki, taken by Odin because of a prophecy and their seeming prospect of ill. We saw her cast into Niflheim and given power over the nine worlds. Among the descriptions of her hall and surroundings, we also heard her words of wager for Baldur's return. We saw Kennings for Baldur as the companion of Hel, and Loki as the father of Hel. Hel as person or place was referred to as residing beneath one of the roots of Yggdrasil. A rooster was said to crow in her halls to herald Ragnarok, and her champions were to follow Loki to that final battle. Lastly, we heard the hero Sigurd say that there is a time when each one of us leaves here for hell. 
As with each one of the characters explored in this podcast, we can learn more about Hal by studying her location, her family, and the story of those whose paths intersect with hers. Now, if you haven't yet listened to the episode on funeral practices and the road to hell, I would definitely recommend it. Be sure to join us next time as we explore what the lore has to say about Hell's sibling, Jormungandr. Thank you so very much for listening today. If you have enjoyed the show, go ahead and give it a follow, a like, whatever, depending on where you are listening. I can be reached through the comments or via email at heathentransgirlpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you again for listening. I hope you have an absolutely fabulous rest of your day or night, where and whenever you are listening. And I will see you next time as we talk about Yormi Baby. All right, take care. Bye.